Hello and welcome to the Pro Tipster Football Podcast. Joining me today are the Dream Team. The three boys are back. We have the Pro Tipsters Dan, Martin and Johnny. Welcome, lads. Good morning. How right. are we? Or well, good afternoon, wherever we you are in the world. We have a magic podcast lined up for you. We have the, th- the Dream Team of the three uh, UK uh, football experts. We also have Pro Tipster Marco on later with his Serie A tips, Pro Tipster David with his La Liga tips, and the boys don't know this, I have something lined up because starting this weekend, the greatest league in the world, the League of Ireland, restarts. So we're going to have a very special guest on from Ireland at the end of the podcast to speak about that as well. Um, Is it Gary Gray? (laughs) <laughs> it's a Gary Breen. Yes. I wish. <laughs> no, it's someone connected with uh, with uh, St. Patrick's Athletic. And, uh, Please, he's be gonna Keith Please be Keith Fahey. Please be Keith Fahey. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> That'd be class. So, yeah, he's going to be coming on at the end. So, uh, yeah, that, that should be good as well. So, it's, it's great that uh, we're getting more and more people involved on the podcast and talking about uh, smaller leagues and, you know, betting opportunities there as well. Right, lads, let's get straight into the football. Friday evening sees... Um, FA Cup action, Leicester are taking on Sheffield uh, United, let me give you the odds here, uh, Leicester 1.55, the draw 4.09, Sheffield United 6.11, let's start with you please, Dan. Oh great, I get to go first, wonderful. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 the recurring theme for FA Cup matches is going to be lineups because yeah. oh, you should always check the lineups before you make a bet. The reason being is that teams rotate for the FA Cup because it's a devalue competition, blah, 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 blah. So Leicester, without winning three, but undefeating five at home. Yes, they got thumped 5-1 by Man City, but this is Man City who are amazing. At home, they're actually pretty good. Um, three clean sheets as well in that, in that, in those five games. <laughs> Sheffield United, one win in three, two wins in seven away. Um, I think this is a distraction for Sheffield United because they, they want to get promoted, whereas Leicester, not really going anywhere in the league. Maybe an FA Cup run would be nice, especially as it's the fifth round now, you know, on the almost on the road to where, almost on the uh, on the way to Wembley, so yes. I think Leicester might take it a bit more seriously. Um, I've not uh, I've not put a bit on yet because of the lineup thing, but the one I'm looking at because of Leicester's good defensive record at home is both teams to score no at one point seven four. Good stuff. Uh, we'll go through Johnny ne- Johnny next. All right. Uh, well, I think this game comes in a bad time for Sheffield United, obviously, who are fighting for the playoffs for in championships. So obviously, the, so the advantage in this case is on Leicester side, who are pr- pretty much playing for nothing in the Premier League. I would say, obviously, they want to get as good as they can, but uh, and they can add the silverware to their uh, tally with, with with the FA Cup. They are not far from Wembley. Um, they can reintegrate Rian Mahrez back into the lineup after his uh, injury. I would say um, this is a for me. Obviously, the lineups will be decisive, but having in mind that uh, Sheffield United uh, will have probably more important matches for them coming up in the in the, in the next couple of days, weeks, Leicester can be quite relaxed. Uh, although, although they will do some rotation, I'm pretty sure. Uh, um, I was looking at the odds and also, as Dan mentioned, the good defensive record of Leicester at home. I'm looking at Leicester minus one at Asian handicap at 1.95. So if Leicester win by one, it's a, it's a void. If they win by more, more than one, it's a one bet. All right. Good stuff. And Mark, over to you. Yeah, pretty much exactly the same as, um, Johnny and Dan have said, really. You've got one word written down here. It's distraction. Um, as, as the guys have said, I think Sheffield United will want to concentrate on the league. They've got QPR, Hull and Reading in their next three games. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll put up a fight, but I, I think Leicester will have this one. I, I, I think Leicester are a little bit short of 1.56, so I'll, I'll be tempted to take them on the handicap, but again, wait for the lineups on that. Um, and, and let's not forget, Leicester smashed them as well in the Carabao Cup earlier in the season. So, uh, you, you know, Amar is back as well. Uh, I, ex- I expect Leicester to field a pretty strong side because, um, you know, it's a great chance to win some silverware. So, yeah, I'll wait for the lineups, but potentially Leicester on the handicap for me. Uh, great stuff. All right, then, so let's move on to the other Friday night match. Chelsea are taking on Hull. A rejuvenated Chelsea, thanks to that thumping that they handed out to West Brom the other night, the Eden Hazard uh, show. Uh, let's, uh, let's stick with you, Martin. 
Uh, yeah, go on. Um, I, <laughs> another thing is, is Hull, why don't, don't want to be in this competition, in, in my personal opinion. They've got to sort their league form out. Um, you know, they're, they're in danger of getting relegated again. Um, which would be catastrophic for them. You know, they're only a point off the relegation zone. Um, and I think Chelsea will field a strong side. You know, Giroud, Christensen and Pedro, they, they all got subbed early against West Brom, which sort of potentially gives an indication of um, where, where the lineup's going to stand for Conte for that one. Um, I reckon they could all start. So... Hull have got Borough on Tuesday night. Um, <clears throat> I think they'll have one eye on that. In, in all honesty, um, so I, I, I don't. I think Hull will rotate. I'm not sure their squad's strong enough to, to rotate too much, but I think I, find, I think Chelsea will find it easy, and I, I'm going to go with Chelsea at minus 1.75 on the Asian handicap, 1.79. All right, good stuff. Over to you, Dan. I completely disagree with Martin on this one. Ooh. Ooh. Fight. Um, yeah, fight. Um, Chelsea have got Barcelona in midweek next week. Um, they've actually got a pretty heavy run of games after this one. <laughs> Barcelona, Man U, Man City, uh, Barcelona obviously home and away. Um, I, I don't think they give a monkey's about the FA Cup. I, I can okay. appreciate. I can appreciate that Hull don't care about the, the FA Cup. But I don't think Chelsea do either, <laughs> because I think they've got bigger fish to fry. Um, Chelsea obviously are going to think about Champions League, and winning the Champions League will be one of the ways to get into it, to staying it next season. So um, Chelsea comes to the game like uh, two wins in five, man, but one loss in seventeen at home since uh, one loss in seventeen at home since September against Bournemouth. Hull, as Martin said, their, their form is really, really bad. Three wins in 15, two away wins in 10. Um, I'm really, really not sure on this because part of me agrees with Martin and says, you know, Chelsea should walk this no matter what team they put out. And part of me goes, well, look at Chelsea like rotating in the past and they've not done well. And, you know, yes, they thumped Albion, but Albion are dreadful. Um, you know, um, so I'm not sure. Um, Hull City obviously without um, Seb Larson who's suspended they were in the news actually um, because their midfielder Ryan Mason he uh, yeah. retired at the age of 26 and what I read one thing I read that kind of links into Chelsea um, is that former Chelsea goalkeeper Petr Cech actually got in touch with him after he broke, uh, fractured his skull and has been like helping him through the recovery process even though Mason's retired he's been giving him lots of advice because obviously Petr Cech went through a similar sort of thing um, he still wears that uh, scrum helmet because his yeah. skull is apparently very, very thin. He's one of triplets, and thus he has a very thin skull. Didn't know that, but it's true. Okay. Um, so just as a, a little aside, but yeah, on this one, I would wait for the lineups, and if like Chelsea really do like go down to bare bones, then maybe look at Hull on the handicap. But otherwise, I'm not sure. I, I, I I'd be tempted to leave this one alone. All right, Johnny. Um, surprise, surprise, but I actually agree with both of them, with both guys. Uh, it's a fact that uh, Chelsea are playing Barcelona in the Champions League, which should, which definitely their focus will be with one eye on that fixture. That's probably their match of the season for now. But at the same time, they don't have too many possibilities to win a trophy, so an FA Cup is one of them that they can still realistically think of. I mean, even if they would rotate, I, I believe they would have enough quality to be, beat Hull. That uh, I completely agree that this game is should be very unimportant for them because they've got more, more, and more important things in the league to worry about. So um, I've read that Chelsea have seen under 2.5 goals in six of their last seven matches against Hull in in all competitions. And have a cl- kept a clean sheet in five of their last six matches against Hull. Um, so, also taking into account these these stats, I would look look the hand the handicap is quite uh, huge, uh, obviously, because uh, Hull is expected to rotate. Chelsea will rotate in a certain extent for sure, but I'm more leaning towards the hand, the positive handicap on Hull. So Hull plus two Asian handicap 
cap with 1.79. This seems to be the value, but uh, on this one for me, whatever the lineups are, even if Chelsea, I, I expect Chelsea to win, but I don't expect them to, to you know, to try to score as many as possible. They will try to maybe score one, two, and then just finish off the game and save some energy for Barca. Thanks for listening to the Pro Tipster Football Show. Check out ProTipster.com where you can earn money by sharing your tips and coupons. Sign up now and get our free daily newsletter where our experts share their tips. Go to ProTipster.com for more details. In a new part of the podcast, I am about to spring on the guys. I'm going to ask them about some Twitter polls that I've been running on my Twitter page. Uh, you can get me ProTipsterPod on Twitter. So in a recent poll I undertook, lads, what did people choose? I'm going to give you four choices here, so please give me your choices. While watching the Real Madrid PSG glamour tie, I was amazed not only by the skill on display, but also by the fine haircuts of some of those involved. So I asked the good people of Twitter uh, which haircut they would choose. Isco's, Rabio's, Zidane's, or Mar- Marcelo's. Martin, who do you think people uh, well, I know the answer to this because I'm very thorough on social media, so I know what you get up to. Oh, well, um, you're out then. Then you're, you're, you're out then. All right, over to you, Johnny. I would definitely go for Zidane's haircut. Rabio. Rabio. Sorry, lads, you're all wrong. Uh, the people of Twitter chose Isco's, which is a good choice, in my opinion. He has lovely hair. Uh, let's move on to Saturday, then. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday are taking on Swansea in the FA Cup. Let's start with you, please, Dan. Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, well, um, this is the tie. Sheffield Wednesday against Swansea. The return of Carvis Carvalhal to Hillsborough. And I think there's going to be a few Sheffield Wednesday fans who are going to be scratching their heads going, why didn't he do this for us? <laughs> <laughs> Magical yeah. for Swansea. Um, yeah, I, I think his time is up at Sheffield Wednesday. Kind of like, uh, it, managers have like a, a shelf life and I think he'd hit his, uh, Sheffield Wednesday. So that's probably why he wasn't doing it there. But, um, so it's going to be a really interesting one. Sheffield Wednesday only lost once in their last nine games. Um, I believe that was the Birmingham City 3-1. Um, <laughs> but they've drawn five. Um, and they've won, lost only once in their last five at home. Uh, Swansea City on beating in nine, four successive away draws. Um, the last round of the FA Cup, they drew with not County away at Gay Meadow. Uh, not Gay Meadow, uh, the uh, Meadow Lane. And then smashed them 8-1 at home, um, and in what was a just a pure one-way traffic. Um, again, lineups. Swansea, I think, I think they might be safe from relegation. I, I, obviously, they're not completely safe yet, but I think Carl Valley has got them sorted out. Again, lineups is key, but I like the draw at 3.25, um, purely because Sheffield Wednesday love a draw, Swansea love a draw. Let's all have a draw and a replay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Martin. Um, yeah, exactly what Dan said. It's going to be a really intriguing game. Probably get tired around, really. But um, for me, that's a neutral. Um, Carvajal will want to prove a point, but then again, Sheffield Wednesday will want to prove a point. And and you know, the Swansea have scored in each of their last eight games. Um, I think Sheffield Wednesday are pulling away from danger in the championship now, so they might actually go for this as well. And, you know, got a cracking win against Derby, uh, quite surprisingly, actually, uh, last time out. So I think there's going to be goals in this one. So I've gone for both teams to score here at 1.83. Um, you know, classic FA Cup tie. Um, I think both sides will not be sitting back and they'll both go for this. And yeah, they'll be There'll be goals, I think. Okay, good stuff then. On to you, Johnny. Well, I think both teams will be very motivated in, in this game, obviously, for the, the return of Carvajal back to Sheffield Wednesday. And uh, also the Sheffield Wednesday, they, they have, well, not much to prove in the in the championship, in the league, uh, other than to, 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 to keep safe from relegation. Um, however, Swansea are in really good form. So that's something to, to consider. But I, I also have this, they're not completely safe from uh, relegation and they have important Premier League fixtures coming up. Brighton, West Ham, where the hardest field, Southampton, all fixtures that they should or they are very capable of winning. So, uh, however, they don't have such a big, busy schedule. So, 
I think this is their only fixture in a 14-day period, so fitness problems shouldn't be should shouldn't be a problem. Um, with the current form, I think if Swansea just takes it this a little bit seriously, they should have the edge for me. So, so Swansea minus 0. 0.25 Asian handicap 1.92. Great, alright uh, A little something a little bit different now I want to talk to Dan just for a moment about Dan, why should we use the Pro Tipster website to log our bets? Well, one of the keys to successful betting is to understand what your bet is to understand where you're good at betting and where you're not good at betting um, If you want to be uh, the kind of person who makes a long term profit you should track what you're betting, track uh, how you get on uh, your hit rate percentage, uh, yield, that sort of thing. And it's difficult to do. Now, pro tips there, you can, uh, weekly all your statistics. And here's the thing. Um, if I bet on 50 games, I've got to put money on 50 games and I might lose like a lot just to find out that I'm only good with three teams. Whereas with pro tips that I can put 50 tips on every day and I can assess, um, if I tip as I would bet, I can over a period of time, Understand which leagues I'm good at. If I'm betting with my head or my heart, if I'm if I'm going in too hard when I shouldn't, if I should stick to to win or handicaps, all that sort of thing. So that when I actually come to betting, I've got a better understanding of what I am as a person, as a gambler, and maybe a better understanding of how I should look for value and what bets I should look for to improve my profits. Exactly. And if it's all going wrong, you can use a exchange. To lay your predictions, isn't that right? Well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm interested in uh, is consensus and trends. So we can see uh, using Pro Tipster how many pe- uh, what what the most popular outcomes are for uh, for uh, every game, and often. It's quite surprising. Often people go for the wrong results, and I've got a theory that um, the best thing to do is to lay. Uh, these kind of games. So it's the, the same applies to if you're no good at betting, then fine. Um, just layer it instead of betting on stuff. Bet against it. You know, lay it instead. So if you, if you're consistently pack, uh, picking favourites that are losing, lay the favourites in the exchanges and make some money. Exactly. You know, um, exchanges are, are a little bit more dangerous. And I, um, as uh, we do with all our videos, you know, we have to tell people to be aware of the risks mm-hmm. of being addicted to gambling. Obviously, bet responsibly. Obviously, keep an eye on how much money you could lose as well as how much you could win. But this is why we use ProTipster because ProTipster is free to lo- uh, free to use, and you're not going to lose anything. All right, let's get back to the football then, uh, Johnny. Let's go over to you. Uh, West Brom are taking on in the All Premier League clash. How do you see this going? Um, I have written with the big letters, uh, no bet for this one. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the I'm the right one to to, to start. No, I just think this is uh, this is unpredictable for me. I mean, both teams will face each other there in second time in two weeks. Uh, Southampton won the 3-2 against West Brom. Uh, I think West Brom lost all of their three league games after they after they beat Liverpool at Anfield. So uh, I don't I don't know what to make of this one. West Brom are at home, but I, I don't really like how they play. I mean, I saw them against Chelsea as well. They were yeah, like Dan said, they were pretty bad. So. But the odds and the lines didn't really represent any value to me. I'm looking for what Dan and Martin will suggest because I can't see anything in this one. Oh, that's fair enough. Let's go over to you then, Martin. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't call it personally. So, um, I think both sides have got big, big problems in the league. So they want to sort that out. But based on the, the game that they, you know, they, that Southampton won uh, 3-2 a couple of weeks ago. That was so open. And I think being an FA Cup game is going to be even more open. And rightly or wrongly, I think Pardew actually wants to do well in this cup competition. Um, you know, you don't go to Anfield and perform like that just to go and, you know, field a reserve side and get knocked out by Southampton. So I think they're going to be going for this. But based on, you know, the last meeting, I think both teams to score at 1.81 is pretty good value for me. So that's what I'm going for. All right, great. And over to you, Dan. Um, I'm actually going to agree largely with what both um, Johnny and Martin have said. Um, I've not actually put 
uh, put a tip down for this one um, because it's really difficult to call. West Bromwich Albion, I, as people know, I come from Birmingham, so I've got, I've got friends who are Badgers fans, and they're a team somewhat in crisis at the moment. Um, after the defeat to Chelsea, they sacked their chief executive and another backroom guy. Uh, apparently, the owner reckons they should have kept Tony Pulis after all. It's a bit of a shocker. <laughs> uh, the fans are unha- the fans all, are all convinced they're going down because um, they're bottom of the table. They're not doing anything. They're not going anywhere, and they're playing really badly. Um, when they played Southampton, they took the lead, but Southampton, uh, like Martin said, it was a big, it was a really open game, and Southampton scored a couple of worldies to come back and win it three two. Um, and I wonder if he'll be. I, I'm curious if he'll be that open again. Um, Albion have. Won once in 14 games at home. Um, Southampton uh, unbeaten four away, one defeat in six. So the temptation would be just to go straight for Southampton, but again, it's about lineups. Um, it's about who picks what, and I, I agree with Martin. I wouldn't be surprised if Pardew goes this because he knows that in the league they're, they're pretty pretty stuffed at the moment. So you've got to give the fans something to cheer about. His position is potentially under threat as well, so he mm. needs a win. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Southampton, you know, Southampton aren't out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. And may- maybe they don't, don't care so much about the FA Cup. So my advice would be, I-, I like the idea of going for goals on this or both teams to score, but I would wait for the lineups and see, see, see what teams, see what teams are put out. If they're stronger, if, if they're open attacking teams, then yeah, definitely go for goals. If they're not, then just, just, do what Johnny said and leave it the hell alone. While uh, West Brom are part of the conversation, I had another Twitter poll during the week. While I was watching the Edwin Hazard <laughs> show versus West Brom uh, last Monday night, uh, I asked this on Twitter and got a great response. So, pro tipster lads, I have uh, four choices for you again. Would you rather have A, Edwin Hazard's ties, B, William's hair, C, Conte's eyes, or D, Alan Pardew's dance moves? Dan. Um, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I because I voted in this poll. I voted for Alan Pardew's dance moves. Good stuff. Okay, uh, Johnny. <laughs> Conte's eyes. Conte's eyes. Okay, and uh, Martin. I voted in this poll as well. Actually, I voted for Pardew's dance moves. Well done, lads. It was, it was a close one. It was a close one between Hazard's ties at 33 <laughs> percent and Alan Pardew's dance moves was the winner at 30. 30- percent <laughs> Let's get back then to the FA Cup and we'll stick with you please Dan Huddersfield are taking on Jose Mourinho's Manchester United Um. So Huddersfield come into the game on the back of two 4-1 wins uh, They beat uh, Birmingham City 4-1 in the replay in the Cup although it was 1-1 at extra time uh, 1-1 going into extra time and Birmingham City fell apart as they want to do but the, the, the last result was really really good um, you know, they look like they've recovered a, a bit of form, which has come at a good time for them. One win in seven at home, though, shows, you know, how poor they have been. Man U, of course, lost to Newcastle United uh, last week. And um, I, I, I think um, I think the, the, the quote after the game was they wouldn't have scored, if, uh, Manchester United wouldn't have scored if they played for 10 hours. <laughs> um, Jose Mourinho, um, in his uh, bid to be best behaved manager of the year, was magnanimous in defeat, um, which is really, really, really surprising. And um, I want to know what he's up to. <laughs> um, Man U got severe. Uh, in midweek in uh, the Champions League, so uh, I, I think I think Mourinho might rotate. I know Mourinho does like the FA Cup and he does take it seriously, mm. and he'll be aware as well that you know Man United aren't going to win the league, and that maybe an FA Cup would be a good trophy to have. Um, Huddersfield have got relegation worries, and I think Wagner takes the FA Cup a little. You know, I don't think he'll take it as seriously. I, I, I think I, I think he'll go not to. Uh, not to get smashed, uh, but they'll lose. Um, I looked at Huddersfield handicap plus one at two point two three, based on the fact that um, Manchester United's away form of late has been poor, that they've got to play severe, and that maybe that they'll bring in, you know, that they'll rotate in some players um, for this game. But again, it's about the lineups. You know, like if you see, um, you know, is it going to be Paul Pogba or is it going to be Scott McTominay? Mm. You know, judging on recent performances, it's going to be Scott McTominay, but you know, it, <laughs> Scott McTominay is going to be the one rested, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, yeah, lineups, always about lineups. Okay, Martin? 
Um, yeah, same as Dan, really. I put line, big, bold letters, underlined lineups. Um, I think United are a little bit too short. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what team they put out. If, if you, if you hear of any team news early, it might be worth jumping on Huddersfield and the handicap if your United team is, is full of reserves. Um, I think Gomez has got a youngster, 70 year old youngster. I hope he plays. I've seen some clips of him recently and he looks, he looks quality. He got a little bit of a run out against Yeovil actually, um, in the last round and he looked good. So, you know, they could go down that route, play a few youngsters and, you know, Huddersfield could, could well pounce on that. Um, I think it's a good time to play United as well, you know. You know, they lost, they lost to Spurs. They lost to Newcastle as well. It's just not away from home. It just doesn't seem to be clicking for United at the minute. Um, but I haven't found anything of value at the moment. Um, so I'm going to wait for the lineups. Um, but potentially, if, the, if, if United are playing a lot of kids and reserves, I'll potentially go for Huddersfield on the handicap. If they're strong, I'll go for United. Magic. And then last but not least, over to you, Johnny. Um, agree with partly with both of you guys, but uh, what I don't agree, uh, I don't agree with Martin. Even if United will feel the, the strongest lineup, I would go with Huddersfield and positive handicap. Just don't like the recently how United play. I think it's getting a bit out of control for Mourinho. Uh, his tactics and the way he he used to well, they used to win the matches. I saw them against Newcastle. Um, well, I don't know what to think of, of of this United side playing like this. Actually, if Pogba doesn't start, that will be an advantage for for United. So I think he's in bad form at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, Huddersfield they've got like a few other teams we mentioned. Uh, they've got important Premier League matches coming up. They've got West Brom, Tottenham, Swansea, Crystal Palace afterwards, and they need to win. They, they definitely they need they can win some of these games uh, to help them for the relegation battle. Interesting stat, Man, Man United have scored at least two goals in their la- five of their last six matches in the FA Cup. Yeah, that's 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 a nice stat, but not in, in this form, perhaps. So even if they rotate, and even if Sergio Romero plays, or Luke, Luke Shaw, Marcus Rojo, whoever, Darmian, Carrick, uh, I, I see a value on Huddersfield, Huddersfield plus 1.25 at 1.89, or similar to what Dan said, Huddersfield plus one or with the uh, over two. But this is the value for me here. Joining me now, like every week, is pro tipster Marco, our Syria uh, expert. Hello, Marco. Hello, Spud. I hope you're well, man. How's things? I, I'm still uh, shocking about uh, Tottenham's uh, comeback yeah. against Juventus. Yeah, you, probably very... saw, you probably saw on, on Twitter I was I was very disappointed. I was really disappointed in, in Gigi Buffon. I think he made uh, two uh, two very bad mistakes. Okay, he did make some very important saves, but he made two, yeah. two, two big mistakes. I hear, though, in the Italian media, uh, a lot of people are blaming... Um, uh, I always get his name. Uh, a lot of people are blaming um, uh, Kadira. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is a, uh, is a always injured and uh, is a is a problem for uh, for Juventus. Yeah, and how do you see how how do you see them going in Wembley? Do you think that they do you think Juventus have a chance now, or or is it is it really for for Spurs to you know is is it? <laughs> how, how do I say that properly? Uh, how, how do you see how do you see the game going in Wembley? Do you think Juve have a chance, or or is it you know? It, in in my in my opinion, not more twenty uh, percent. Uh huh. Wow, that's damning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty bad. Um, right. So look, um, wh- why did it go so wrong for for Juventus? Ma, maybe uh, they think uh, Spurs uh, is not a. Uh, a uh, top uh, club, but uh, the reality is uh, is different. <laughs> a, a, a mental problem, in my opinion. You think so? Yeah, I've heard that as well. Some some uh, UVA fans have told me that this season they've had this kind of mentality problem, and it's yeah, something yeah, that, yeah. that they can't get rid of. Which is uh, which for me is crazy because they're second in the league. They can they can win the league. You know they're a very good Champions League side. Okay, they they screwed up during the week, but they didn't lose. They still haven't lost at home in the Champions League since they changed yeah, stadium. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing record. Sure, sure Se- Se- Serie A is not the Champions League, and uh, <laughs> we see we see it. Uh, 
uh, with uh, group stage of Napoli mm-hmm. and uh, is the reality Absolutely. And Napoli play today uh, in the Europa League, but their manager has said he doesn't really care about Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah which is understandable. For, for me, for me, is uh, is difficult to understand this uh, this sentence, but uh, they <laughs> Napoli uh, want to 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 win uh, uh, campionato. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um yeah, I don't blame him. If if he wants to, if he, if he wants to prioritize the league and and finally take it away from Juventus, then it, it's understandable. Uh, look, Marco, let's get on then to this weekend's uh, action. There's a yeah. there's a full program of matches. I suppose the highlight for me is the Torino derby, Torino and Juventus, and of course then in the evening there's Milan and Sampdoria. But do you have any tips for us? Um, not a, a specific uh, tips for Torino Juventus, but uh, in uh, this uh, derby. I like to to bet on the red card. Yes, so <laughs> this will be uh, an uh, an idea. But I have uh, four uh, speed tips for you. Four. Go for it. Um, one is about Atalanta Fiorentina. Atalanta play uh, this uh, this night against Dortmund and the next next week. So in seven day to. To match against uh, a top club uh, uh, like Dortmund is very, uh, very difficult for Atalanta. Uh, this, uh, this is a good team, but uh, the bench is not long. So, in my opinion, uh, double chance out of Fiorentina that uh, uh, we, ha- uh, we had uh, uh, one week to prepare this uh, this match. Pioli is a good uh, is a good uh, coach, uh, so. A double chance out uh, about one point eighty is a good uh, is a good tip uh, in my opinion. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Um, other tips are about uh, probably uh, um, uh, a draw that uh, two teams like it. Uh, example: Bologna versus Sassuolo. Is a region derby, but uh, um, the standings uh, uh, tell us that a draw is good for uh, for uh, for both. And uh, uh, same uh, um, same idea in the, in uh, Kiev versus uh, Cagliari. So um, a draw is a is a good uh, is a good uh, chance. And finally. I want uh, to to bet uh, um, to Benevento to win against Crotone is a very very important match for a relegation uh, and uh, in my opinion uh, are two teams uh, that have um, same quality uh, but uh, um, Benevento play uh, at home and for me um, Benevento to win is a is a good tips. Okay, uh, Marco, I'll put I, I I think I'll put this Benevento one into our uh, pro tipster accumulator. Okay, because uh, every week yeah, now we're yeah, going yeah. to do this uh, uh, accumulator with uh, you, pro tipster David, and uh, the English guys as well. Okay, uh, is that do everything? You, do, you, do you have Do you have to to um, to think uh, only a thing that uh, Benevento have only seven points, but these seven points. Uh, uh, has arrived in home match. So for me, with Crotone can be, can be win. Excellent. Good stuff. All right, Marco. Uh, I want to ask you though about, uh, Milan and Sampdoria. This is, this was always a big game. When I was growing up, you had the likes of, uh, uh Hullet and Sadoff and then David Platt played for Sampdoria as well when I was growing up. Uh, do you have any, uh, not a, not a tip, but do you have any prediction for it? Yeah, mm, is a is a difficult uh, is a difficult match to predict. So i- in this match, uh, my my idea is uh, no bet, best bet. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Okay, so just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just watch it with a bottle of beer. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Exactly. Look, Pro Tips and Marco, thank you. Like every week, thank you so much for coming on, and we'll speak to you next week. Bye bye. See you next week. As you probably know, podcasts still grow by word of mouth. Show your support for the Pro Tipster Football Show by telling your football mad friends all about our podcast or by leaving a nice review for us on iTunes. That was uh, Pro Tipster Marco. 
with his uh, Syriac tips. Uh, as you'll have heard, um, we have put uh, the Benevento versus Crotone game into our accumulator. So I'll stick that in here. I think the lads agreed on, on Leicester and Sheffield United, didn't they? Uh, so we'll put Leicester in here and Asian handicap minus one. I'm not too sure, lads. Will I put Huddersfield handicap in here? I know two of you agreed on it. I'll leave it. I'll probably leave that. We'll leave it. Okay. So. Well, we'll we'll find more consensus by the end of the podcast anyway. So <laughs> the next match, then we're off to the Bundesliga, and sixth place Schalke are taking on eighth place Hoffenheim. Now, Martin, we'll start with you because I know you've seen Hoffenheim uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, I went to Hamburg versus Hoffenheim. Um, they were shocking. They were so bad. Hamburg won that three nil, but it's it's one of those Hamburg. Um, Hamburg played really well that day, and. Hoffenheim just just don't travel well away. At home they're really good, but away from home it's it's a complete mixed bag at the minute. And they've not won at Schalke for the last seven years. Um, but Schalke did lose two one to Werder Bremen in the last home game, um, and Werder Bremen are struggling themselves. So it's a tough one to call, you know. Um, Hoffenheim only one win in the last nine away, and that was against Cologne, who everyone. You know, everyone's beating Cologne this season. Um, Serge Gnabry, weirdly, he's been playing the last couple of games at right back for Hoffenheim, which I I find a a bit weird. Um, So, uh, for me, it's tough. I'm I'm probably going to go down the middle at 3.50 on the draw. Um, Schalke probably at the edge on paper, but Max Meyer is suspended, which is a little bit of a blow for them. Um... They've got Brill and Bolo as well, who, who Dan's written a lovely article about ahead of the World Cup. Um, if he starts, it'll be the first time since February 2016 that he's started two games in a row. I think that's criminal. Uh, like, he's an absolute talent. He, he should be playing more. Um, so I think if he starts, then, then Schalke will probably win. So I'm, I'll wait for the lineups on this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of draw at the moment, but if, if Schalke's side is strong and then Bolo starts again, I might go with Schalke at 2.05. Fair enough. Uh, Johnny? I think this game has goals written all over it. Uh, I'll explain why. So I, I'm looking at over 2.5 goals at 1.7. So it, it's a sixth team against eighth team. Obviously, Schalke are in poor form at the moment after the winter break. Both are pretty offensive teams for me. Uh, seven out of the last ten head-to-head matches were all worse. Schalke scored at home in each of their home games this season, except home game against Bayern, which they lost 3-0. And I think Hoffenheim scored in quite most of their away games. I think they're just just by th- but three games that they didn't score, but they are scoring pretty regularly away from home. So... Both teams have absences in the creative midfield, like Martin said. My mayor for Schalke, Jamie Bay, shouldn't is missing for Hoffenheim, so that might be uh, a bit negative to this bet. But I still believe that uh, these teams should produce a offensive team. We all know that uh, German Bundesliga is known for a lot of goals and for uh, quite offensive uh, strategies by teams. So I'm going for over 2.5 goals at one point seven. Which stuff over to you then, Dan? Okay, so as Martin said, I wrote a piece about Brilliant Bolo, uh, which is on our betting news section in um, Pro Tipstar. So if you log into Pro Tipstar on the left hand side of the screen, you'll say you'll see uh, news. Click on that, and it's one of the articles in there. I wrote about Brilliant Bolo uh, about his time at Schalke and how, why he might be the man to step up for Switzerland in the World Cup. Um, it's interesting actually because as like Martin said he's not started two consecutive games since August 2016 now he did have a really bad broken leg um, last year and that ruled him out from like I think it was from October till the start of this season and Schalke have been very wary about bringing him into uh, first team action too quickly you know they've been giving him uh, time off the bench. He's been making, he's been coming off the bench and playing and slowly improving. He started against Bayern last week. And it's interesting because Schalke have kind of switched their formation a little bit. So they were playing with, um, either Franco de Santo or, uh, Piazza, uh, P- P- Piazza, I think, I can't pronounce his name, uh, partner in their main striker, Bergstaller. 
And against Mew, against Bayern, they, they play with three up front. So they played, uh, Berg Salah kind of is like a, a left footer. So they played him on the left. And then Bolo is quick and he's a right, he, he play, can play either on the right or up front. So he played on the right and Berg Salah played in, uh, sorry. And Franco Di Santo, as who you probably remember for his time at Chelsea, is a tall, lanky target man type. So they were playing with that kind of formation. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if they do that again against Hoffenheim. Hoffenheim, like Martin said, uh, their away record is poor. They've not won away in six uh, Bundesliga games, I think it is. Um, they've drawn two and lost three of the last five. Um, Schalke have only lost one of their last five home Bundesliga games. So, looking at this, I, I, I like the look of uh, Schalke to win. I'm, I'm not a Bundesliga expert. Um, I only know about this game because I read about Mbolo because I was writing about him, about him playing for Switzerland. Um, Hoffenheim beat Schalke in the reverse fixture in September. Um, but that was at home. Half and home are completely, completely different side um, playing away. Schalke have actually not lost to Hoffenheim in the league at home since 2011, which is six games. So, um, I don't know. I definitely like the look at goals. I think Schalke will win, um, but it's a tough one to call. So, my tip would probably be to go for over two and a half goals. I think it's around one point. Uh, I've not checked, but it's about 1.75, 1, 1. 1.7, somewhere like that. What Johnny had as well. Yeah, 1 by yeah. 7. All right, will we put this into yeah. the hacker? Uh, that's up to you. I, I, I'm happy with it's going to the hacker. Yeah, over two and a half in the hacker. Let's do it. All right. Let's return to Blighty then, Britain, not just England, where Cardiff City are taking on Middlesbrough in the English league system. How is that for you, Dan? <laughs> That's much better. I'm just thinking of our Welsh listeners going, we're not bloody English. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're the closest. You know, in uh, in the Irish language, uh, Wales translates as uh, Little England. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, or, or Little Britain. I, I'm going to Google that while, while you're talking. Uh, Martin, let's go with you. Um, yeah, intriguing game actually. Um, I think Cardiff obviously doing the better of the two sides in the league at the moment. Um, they lost to, you know, they've lost to Preston and Fulham in the last four and, you know, the last few home games they've been impressive, but they're against the likes of Hull, Sunderland and Bolton. So, just looking at those, they kind of seem to struggle at home when tested against the better teams. However, um, I can't. I honestly, I can't ignore the two point four and offer a card offer Cardiff to win at home to, um, in this game. I think they should probably be around two point one ish. Are a, a bit of a mixed bag home and away this season. Um, you know, they lost to Norwich in the last away game one nil. Uh, it's quite close actually because you know, I didn't do themselves any favours because Gested got sent off after half an hour in that game. But a win for, a win for Cardiff, you know, they they could jump back into the automatic promotion spots. So I think. Uh, Borough are, sh- are close to missing out on playoffs at the moment, but I, I think Cardiff are going to have enough for me. So I, I just honestly just can't ignore the two point four. I think it's value, so that's what I'm going for. Magic. Uh, let's go to you then, Johnny. Yeah. So I finally prepared something for the championship. Uh, I've learned something from from the guys. Uh, I will keep this just nice and short. So uh, obviously Cardiff are a strong home team, and exactly. I- agree with Martin that 2.4 for the home win is something that we shouldn't ignore. There's high motivation, obviously, for, for both teams. Middlesbrough are a bit more desperate. But uh, even if the recent matches and uh, the performances of Cardiff were uh, good performances were against the lower sides, I still would... Uh, I, I, I consider this a value. Cardiff uh, minus 0. 0.25 at 2.04 on Prolips here. That's, that's a value for me. Good stuff. And you, Dan? Um, so, I, I didn't actually look at the result of this game. I looked at goals, and I'll tell you for why. So, uh, Middlesbrough, um, their away record's not bad. They've won three of the last five away in the Champions, uh, Championship. Been loads of goals, though. Um, Overs has won in four of the last five away games. Um, they lost 2-1 away to Millwall. Uh, then they beat Sheffield Wednesday 2-1, beat Preston North End 3-2, QPR 3-0. Okay, they lost 1-0 to Norwich, but they play Cardiff now, and Cardiff's home record is, you know, they, they Cardiff score goals too. 
Um, they scored four against Sunderland, two against Bolton. Uh, they lost 4-2 to Fulham. And so I looked, and over two and a half goals, at 2.19. And I thought that was rather high, and that's where I'm going. Now, I might have got this completely wrong, because it might be a tight game with both teams kind of like thinking... Crap, you know, you know, Cardiff City, obviously, one point off second, they're going to be thinking, you know, we need to win this to go up, uh, to, to get higher up the table. Middlesbrough in ninth, uh, just outside the playoff place is four points behind Bristol City. But I think this is a game where both teams actually need to win rather than not lose, which means they'll play more attacking football. And I just like the look of that over two and a half. At 2.19, it says value to me, and that's why I'm going for it. Fair enough. All right, then let's uh, stick, stay in the championship. Fifth place, Fulham are taking on second place, Aston Villa. Uh, we'll stick with you then, Dan. Paddy watched the second city derby with me, and he'll know how mad I was. I walked out after the second city goal, a uh, second goal for them. I was like, Ugh. Um, but had um, if and yeah, if my auntie had testicles, she'd be my uncle. Um, if Sam Gallagher's shot was one inch to the right, we'd have gone one and up, and. Who knows what will have happened. And they have been lucky. Um, the Pink and Baby Blue Mob have been lucky. Uh, yes, they won seven in the spin, but uh, I think had that goal gone in, yes, we were the poorer team, but it could have gone in either way at that point. They um, they only squeaked past Burton. Uh, Burton came back twice, uh, lost 3-2. 90th minute, Robert Snodgrass goal to beat Forrest. And their last three away wins have all been by single goal to nil. So although they've won seven on the spin, I'm not convinced, but I'll never be convinced. Fulham have won six on the spin at home in the championship. Uh, won six on the spin in the championship, unbeaten in nine. Um, playing really well at home. Scored 15 goals at home. And I've got written... Underlined capital letters, Fulham to win, please, please, dear God, Fulham to win. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, this is me betting with my heart, so um, you might be better off listening to the other guys. All right, so we'll find out what, what they've gone for. Uh, Martin? Uh, I've gone down the middle. I can't separate either side. I've gone for the draw at 3.37. Um, yeah, Fulham nine games without defeat, six wins in a row at home, Villa won seven in a row. I mean, both teams, no, in, no real injuries going into this. Both, you know, clean bill of health. Um, Snodgrass at Doma look good, in good form for Villa at the minute. But I, I'm, I'm, inter- I'm going to enjoy it watching this game, uh, if I can. Uh, I'm interested to see how Ryan Sessignon gets on at left back. He's 17. He's surely going to be moving to a big club in the summer. He scored 11 goals from left back already for Fulham this season. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it'd be a great game. And I cannot separate either side, so I'm going for the draw at 3.37. Good stuff. And Johnny? Um, I agree with uh, Martin. I was looking at the draw, but uh, then uh, I think it all, all it all depends how Villa will absorb the pressure from Fulham. Um, they will, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Villa will change the tactics, uh, like, like all the teams do it when, when they play Fulham. So, Fulham will have the possession, they will put the pressure on their opponent. Uh, it's hard to separate these teams to, to, to top clash in championship. I've gone for under 2.5 goals at 1.8. I just think that, uh, Aston Villa will try everything they can to, to stop Fulham and they will not be too interested in play, playing forward and we will not see too many goals in this one uh, Join us now we have our uh, La Liga uh, our Spanish uh, pro tipster expert pro tipster David Hola Señor Hello Señor how are you? <laughs> Very good I'd say you're even better you're our uh, resident Real Madrid fan you must be buzzing today I'm so happy, man. So, so happy. <laughs> the king of Europe is back. Yeah, yeah. We did warn you. We, 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 we had said on our, on our live streams that these, this was the type of game that, that Real Madrid were going to come back for. You know, their league form hasn't been, uh, hasn't been very good at all. But, uh, those, these types of games, it's the Champions League when Real Madrid come alive. Uh, what was it for you though, David, that you noticed about the game? When, when did it change? Well, for me, the change when he made the substitution, when Asensio and Lucas Vázquez came to the game, and he started to play like, uh, let's say, 4-5-1, one, 
and you have more control on the on the on the midfielders. So it was the the, the key for me. It was my my opinion because before of this, to be honestly speaking, I have uh, this on my pants when Neymar too. <laughs> when Neymar had the ball, I had this on my pants really because he's that kind of guy that he can change everything. And well, uh, PSG plays will play really really well. Let's say that for me they play well. They play well. They had the ball. They had chances. But you know this is Real Madrid and this is Champions League. Man, they they had the millions, but they still need to learn a bit uh, more how, how to play. Class, okay. You know, yeah. as uh, all Chelsea fans will will be aware of. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there's some talk today though that um, with Arsenio playing so well and uh, on that side that there is some talk today that we might well uh, be seeing the, at the end of days for Gareth Bale at Real Madrid and he could be forced out during the summer uh, do you think there's any truth to this? Yeah, yeah I think so because to be honest if Gareth Bale didn't play today on yesterday sorry in the lineup, it means that for Zidane is I mean he's important player and I like him but uh, let's say that for Real Madrid style he's not he's not player for Real Madrid style he is good player in contra attack like uh, running with free paces but with Real Madrid not good because you know the the opponents again Real Madrid they are not playing like uh, let's say like maybe in Premier League like it's like more open game like uh, more box to box running from one area to other area it's different kind of kind of game it's like more control the ball and Gareth Bale yeah you watch him in, in Tottenham. He was crazy, you know. That guy was so crazy how how he did. But in La Liga, for me, he good player, but no, no. Real Madrid style enough for him, honestly, enough for him. I think, I mean, for me, in my opinion, he should be back to England. Maybe in Manchester United, he, he did with Mourinho, playing in contra-attack, the kind of, of games. I really hope it's not Mourinho. It could be interesting Mourinho for him. will just turn him into a left-back or something. You know, he's so negative. Look what he's done to Pogba. He's pretty much ruined Pogba as a player. And uh, Alexis Sanchez hasn't done well either. But anyway, that's for the Premier League talk. Um, what's happening this weekend, David, in, uh, in La Liga? Well, I have been checking out for me, let's say I have two games that are quite interesting in order to get some, some money. Uh, the first one for me, the more interesting game of the weekend is uh, on Saturday, the Barcelona travel to Eibar to play against Eibar, of course. And uh, let's say because Barcelona is after two games without winning in La Liga, and they are thinking about the, the Champions League game that next week they play against Chelsea, of course, you know. And Eibar have been fantastic over the last, the past few months. They are doing really, really well. And especially at home, they play really well because Ipurua is really a small stadium. And it's not going to be easy for Barca to play the game with free spaces that they are doing uh, uh, normally. So for me, I mean, you see the odds I was, I was checking and Barca to win is paying like uh, 1.44. Not too much. So I'm thinking about uh, both, both teams to score. It's around 1.79. That one can be interesting because, yeah, of course, Barcelona will score, I'm sure. That Messi, Suarez, the guys, they are going to score a goal. And I think Eibar can do at least one goal. I'm not sure if they are going to win because it will be hard. But at least I think they are going to have uh, one goal, in my opinion. Uh, Eibar. All right, what's the second one? And the second one, I'm thinking about Athletic Bilbao against Atletico de Madrid. It's an interest, interesting game. Uh, they play today, Europa League, you know. Both teams, they play away. They have long trip because Atletico played in Copenhagen against, uh, sorry, they yeah, play in Copenhagen against Copenhagen in Dinamark. And Atletico uh, Bilbao play in Russia against uh, Sparta. Moscow, so they have really long trips. And um, considering these Europa League tri- trips plus how they are doing this season, Atletico, I see that they have so many draws at home, and mainly is uh, nil nil. And Atletico de Madrid under Simeone, as always, so focus on defensive uh, duties. So I expect not so many goals. So I'm thinking about under two and a half goals, and odds are around one around 1.60. So for me, this is kind of interesting. And I had to add as well that. Costa, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that about Costa will play that game. And um, for Athletic Bilbao, Adurit. Adurit is out due to cars, or he's the, the, the striker of Athletic Bilbao, the best striker that they have. So I think that this game will be under two and a half, I think. It can be quite interesting. Like I said, are, they have two trips, long trips in Europa League today. Um, they are playing in defense mainly this season, so it can be interesting, I think, these two 
these two games. Okay, magic. So I'll stick one of those into the accumulator. Uh, the one with the higher odds is uh, Eibar and Barcelona, both teams to score. I'll stick that in our pro tipster podcast sure. accumulator. Uh, pro tipster David, thank you so much for coming on, uh, man, and we'll speak to you next week. Yeah, for sure. See you. If you have any betting questions you'd like to ask, don't be shy. Get in touch with Patty, Martin, or Dan on Twitter. Pro Tipster IRL, Pro Tipster EN, or Pro Tipster DAN. Or on Facebook at Pro Tipster UK. Right then, so we have, that was Pro Tipster David. Thank you very much for coming on. And another tip has been added to our accumulator there. We have one, two, we have four so far. We'll probably get another one before the end of the show as well. So let's go on to Sunday and we have the Torino Derby. Torino in ninth place are taking on Juve in second. We had Pro Tipster Marco on earlier and he was saying that if he was to tip something in this match, he would probably tip a red card. Uh, let's go with you, Johnny, please. So, Derby de la Mole, uh, you, uh Derby, uh, I'll first say my pick, so I, I've got Juve to win, uh, Juve, Juve won the past four out of pa- uh, five head-to-head matches, all of them but more than by one goal, which is an interesting stat. Uh, Turin are quite in good form, they are, in 2018, they are three wins, two draws, uh, they are fighting for the Europa League spots, so while uh, we know that Juve are, uh, battling with Napoli for its, for the title. Uh, Juve played a tough game against Tottenham, conceded first goals in the new year. So this is going to be a really, really a challenge for uh, Bianco Neri. But uh, I think Torino will come uh, very confident into this clash at the Olympic Stadium in, in Turin. Uh, however, uh, Juve don't play uh, Champions League next week because it's, they played one this week and they get next week uh, North Champions League so they can be fully focused on this one and um, it's a f- they are in good form even they, they had good spells uh, in their games against Tottenham uh, Torino are not that quality of Tottenham and if they can keep the level uh, through the 90 minutes uh, they will I think win so 1.73 for you will win Martin um, yeah, don't have too much on this, apart from Juve are going to win at 1.73. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Torino, I think Torino have beaten Juventus in Serie A twice since 1995. Um, oh, one was a couple of seasons ago though, you remember that. I mean, if, if they, I, I think those stats are right and that's incredible and I just don't, I know it's a derby, but, Juventus just have too much, so I think they're, I think Juventus are a great price at 1.73. I expected them to be a little bit shorter, to be honest. So that is one game for. Yeah. I, I fully agree. It's a, it's a great price for Juventus. One of my good friends is from uh, from around Torino, and uh, he says a, a lot of people in the city support uh, Torino. All of the all of the rednecks uh, support uh, U, uh, Juventus, but he actually calls the Torino people swamp donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice, isn't it? Uh, right, uh, Dan is taking a, a leave of absence on, on, on the remaining games because he prefers to uh, uh, study the, the English games. Isn't that right, Dan? That's exactly right, Paddy. Fair yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert. I, I'm, I don't watch enough uh, foreign games to be able to um, talk about them that well. So oh, well, look, best. That, that, that is fair enough. There's no point in giving advice if you're not confident about it, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Only two more left, though. Uh, let's uh, go to the Bundesliga, where uh, number or 10th place, Borussia Mönchengladbach are taking on Borussia Dortmund in third. Uh, Johnny? Dortmund are in, uh, in great form, finally. Uh, I think they found their form recently. Um, since the defeat to Bayern in the Cup, they are without uh, defeat. They will most likely fight for the second place. Uh, one interesting stat, last five head-to-head matches were over 3.5 goals, so plenty of goals in uh, this matchup between Gladbach and Dortmund. Uh, Bacua is a great signing for Dortmund. Uh, I think he was... Uh, Dortmund, since he joined, won twice and he scored, I think, five goals. Uh, Marco Reus uh, made his return, so they're a bit stronger. Uh, they've got Yarmolenko, uh, I think, out, Philip and Schmelter, which is a blow, but then Batuai and Royce, that's, that's, that's promising. Gladbach are in poor form. Uh, they lost four out of five in the new year. However, I look at the, 
to the start, I was saying to telling you that about the last five head to head matches going over 3.5. It's really interesting. And I, I can see it happening with the, with the way Gladbach defend nowadays and with, with the form that Dortmund found. So over 3.5 goals at 2.27. That's a nice, that's a nice one. Alright, very good. Uh, Martin. Um, I don't think I need to say much else because <laughs> Johnny's literally taken everything that I had written down. I've gone for over three and a half at 2.27. Um, like Johnny said, last six in a row have been over three and a half. 29 goals in those games, which averages out to 4.8 goals per game, which is incredible. And I, I don't see that changing. I think, I think it'll be an open game and, and Dortmund are in, are in pretty good form. So 2.27 for that, I think, I think it's pretty good value. So we agree on that one. Magic. I'll stick those two uh, into the academy as well. So you both picked uh, Juventus to win and now we're going with uh, Munchen Gladbach and Dortmund to have more more than three and a half goals. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have six in the ACA so far and one final game to go. AC Milan in seventh are taking on sixth place Sampdoria. Martin? Um, I haven't got too much on this. I mean, if I had to choose between Bundesliga and Serie A, it'd be Bundesliga all the way for me. But um, just... <laughs> but just primarily on the uh, last five meetings, uh, they've been unders, 2-0, uh, 1-0, 1-0, 1-0, 2-0. And simply based on that, um, and the fact that both are uh, pretty even and can't be separated really this season, I've gone for unders at, at 2.01. I should remind you as well that, uh, of course, you, you won't have heard this, we will edit in, uh, we will have Marcos' uh, uh, section edited in. He told me that the best bet on this game would be no bet. He's just going to sit there with a beer and watch it. What do you, uh, what, do you have any predictions, Johnny? Um, I fully agree with Martin again. So I, this is exactly what I've gone for. Under 2.5 goes at 2.01. Uh, Milan are finally getting better and better uh, under Gennaro Gattuso, although his beginnings were not so convincing. But now it's uh, getting better. Sampdoria, pretty good form. In the last five, three, one, two, two draws. Uh, although Milan got Kalinic out, he's out for the Europa League games today. They play in uh, Razgrad against Ludogorets in Bulgaria. Area. So I suppose he's going to be out for uh, this area our game as well. Uh, and they've got so Kalinic out, Kessi uh, have eight goals uh, between them will be missing. So that's a blow for Milan. Uh, and they they struggle a bit to score at home. So with both teams in form, uh, but then you have to say that. Milan are unbeaten in eight, despite facing teams like Inter or Lazio. So it's hard to separate these these two teams. I would fancy Milan to get a narrow win or or a draw. So, but two, definitely there will not be too many goals. I think so. Under two point five goals at two point zero one, quite good odds for. For this bet. That's pretty amazing. We were looking bad for the Aka, and then in the last <laughs> three matches, the boys have come together, and it's almost like uh, uh, you'd expect it was fixed, you know. But not at all, not at all. This is uh, we, we we have no idea what our tips are going to be when we start the podcast uh, among ourselves. Joining me on the line now, we have Ronan O'Flaherty, an Irish sports journalist who is an expert on the League of Ireland. Well, that's what I'm going to call you, and you're Ronan. How's it going? How are you, Paddy? Um, yeah, I appreciate that expert in the League of Ireland, you know, for some people that's probably, that, that's a major red flag for some people <laughs> when they see League of Ireland experts. <laughs> well, look, I've had the lads, I, I was telling the lads in the podcast that, uh, that uh, you were coming up and a couple of them uh, were excited. I said that you were, um, I said that you were a, a follower and an associate of St. Pat's Athletic and the lads were hoping that it would be Keith Fatty, Keith Fatty, because uh, one of them's a Birmingham City fan. Oh, you know, when Keith Fahey, around the time Keith Fahey left Pats for uh, Birmingham City, you know, he was he, he was a legend, a god amongst Pats fans, and then he came back, which just made his legendary status even greater. Um, and, uh, you know, he was part of the team that won the Pat, won the Cup with Pats in 2014 uh, to uh, to bridge a 53-year gap since Pats had previously won the Cup. Unfortunately, he subsequently signed for Samrock Rovers, which dirties his bid. So there's a bit of a divide there uh, about Keith Lahey at the moment. You know, yeah, no doubt yeah. a great player and did some great stuff for Pat. But his decision to sign for Shamrock Rovers, who he only actually played for then a handful of times because he 
pretty uh, bad um, hip injury, I think it was, that forced him into retirement. That's right. That yeah. season that he signed for all. Yeah, I have. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you and to the listeners that uh, St. Pat's would be my my second Irish team, I suppose. When I had moved up to Dublin, um, my local team, uh, Wexford, didn't even exist, so I had to pick a Dublin team, and I picked the one which uh, which was closest to me in inch core, and it was St. Pat's. And I used to go up there at the odd time, and uh, yeah, Keith Fahey was an absolute legend. He was a great player. He was miles and miles better than anyone else on the field. He used to dictate it. He was, you know, he was our Andrea Pirlo there for a while, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, he was very good, yeah. And there was no doubt that the ability was there from the start. As a teenager, he was over with Arsenal and Aston Villa. You know, you, you've heard the story, you know, the, the, those players are, are are all over the place, but he did, he did well to, you know, get the move back over yeah. in, in his mid-twenties. He surely did, right? But look, Cork are reigning champions. Dundalk did give them a good run for their money, but they fell away uh, towards the end. Ronan, how do you see the league going this year? Will it be those two fighting it out again, or, or can the likes of, okay, I know they're, they're mortal enemies, uh, Shamrock Rovers, or yourselves, Pats, even Bowes or Derry, can they mount a challenge, or is it going to be those big two again? I would be surprised if anyone put it up for, to the big two again. Um, I just think they're so far ahead of the rest. Um, unfortunately, because I don't, you know, I think any league that has a bit of a duopoly like that for more than a few years, it's not really that healthy. But, um, yeah, you know, they, they, they're just so far ahead of the rest. Last year, it looked like Derry were going to push them. Um, unfortunately, tragic circumstances, Derry's season fell apart when, when Ryan McBride passed away. Up to that point, they looked like they were going to push, uh, uh, Cork City and, and uh, and Dundalk, I, I I don't know um, if what what state of mind Derry City are in this season. If anyone can push those two, it is perhaps Derry City. But um, I I see it going between Dundalk and Cork City. I think Dundalk will win it, not by much. And I think the next team, the third place team, will probably be ten or fifteen points further back. It'll probably be probably be Derry. And then I think fourth place will be a, a you know a shootout between teams like. Sham Crowvers, Pats, um, you name it. Um, the league is, it's only a 10 team league, but it's probably got about five or six different compartments yeah. in it. Uh, we'll get, get to the new format there in, in a minute. I'm going to ask you that. But it's, um, it's kind of mad. Like, it, the, the league was very, was so much a Dublin centric thing for, for a long, long time. And now the Dublin teams, they've fallen away quite a lot, haven't they? They have, yeah. Like, the, you know, these things, it's funny, these things are cyclical. Um, I was just talking to a guy the other day, and he, and he, and he seems to think that, you know, this was Dundalk's only period of success, but, you know, historically, Dundalk are hugely successful, uh, by Kofi's one, they're the second most successful team in League of Ireland history. But that said, it is true, you say, you know, um, in the last 20 years, right, a glut of league titles have been won by Dublin teams, be it Rovers, Pats, in themselves, you know, turn the millennium were dominant, both. But in the last few years, um, yes, Kenny, Stephen Kenny being appointed by, by Dundalk changed everything. It was an absolute massive stroke. Dundalk were going nowhere. They had just stayed in the Premier Division by, by the skin of their teeth. They had beaten Waterford United in a relegation promotion playoff. And they appointed Stephen Kenny, and that changed everything. In the first season, they were runners up to Pats. Then they won the next three leagues. And last season, they were runners up to Cork. So, you know, that changed everything. Uh, Cork had been pushing Dundalk hard for the past four seasons, and they finally got, you know, the better of them last year. Um, so I, I fancy Dundalk to, to, to get one over on Cork again this year. You know, I fancy it to go to Dundalk for the fourth time in five years this coming season. Cool, good one. Um, uh, this new format then, so uh, they've gone to 10 teams in over two leagues instead of having 12 in one and, and, and 8 in the other. Um, look, I don't know what your opinion on this is, but I'll give you mine anyway. I think with Ireland being uh, so small, I think it might be beneficial if there was just one league and everyone was in it because it would force the worser teams to up their game. A bit like with the, I'm not a rugby fan, but I know that the, the, the what they got the Tri Nations in the Southern Hemisphere, they, they welcomed Argentina into their thing and Argentina got a lot, a lot better over the years. The same with Italy. They joined six, the five nations making it six and now they're a much better team than they were before. I would be of the opinion that letting uh, lesser teams 
playing against better teams makes them better. But the FAI obviously don't see it that way. Or am I completely yeah, wrong? Well, What's your you opinion? Know, unfortunately, think there's a lot of there's a lot of moving around the deck chairs in Titanic. But, you know, <laughs> the people who are in charge of the league, I don't know how much they want to see it improve. You know, we've seen a ten team Premier before. Yeah. It's uh, so it's gonna be it's gonna be thirty six games. Teams are gonna be playing each other four times. Yeah. At first, think that's too much. By by the time you get around to playing them for the fourth time in the season, it's an awful lot. And it, it it's very possible you play them in both competitions. And you know the the familiarity that they would would truly be contempt. I your point about um one division of maybe, I don't know, 18, 20 teams. It's an interesting one. Um, I know a few people that would be keen on that idea. I just wonder what happens when, you know, when you're down towards the bottom at the end of the season, and, but you're not threatened by relegation, and you kind of, you know, you do you down to um, mm-hmm. how that impact. I, I just worry about that aspect of it, because, you know, the, the, the quality doesn't exist in the provincial leagues for, for, for a relegation promotion in that kind of way. Um, so, I think the relegation uh, aspect would need a, would need a deep thought for that to work. No, no, yeah, you're supposed to. It's something I hadn't really thought of. I suppose. Um, tell us though that I mean, I'm only going on on, on social media and, and and stuff like that and reading a, a bit of news. I think that there's a there's a good buzz this year about the start of the league, isn't there? Yeah, there's always a good buzz. Like we're we're we are a peculiar bunch, you know, and. Um, there's two, uh, there's kind of two types of League of Ireland fans. There's the, there's, the, there's the guy, maybe a bit like me, who, you know, who's extremely passionate about their local club and tries to get their friends on board to come down to matches. And then there's the other type of fan that, you know, uses it as a badge of honour to, you know, to beat over the head with anyone they see wearing an English <laughs> Premier League jersey. Um, you know, that, that I think is a bad idea and yeah. counterproductive. But that's, that's the League of Ireland fans in a nutshell. We're a funny bunch. And, uh, the start of this season is like no other. People, you know, uh, people can't wait. Um, I'm not a Bowles or, or a Rovers fan, but that's, that's a sellout. That, that match in Daily Mail for tomorrow. My own team, St. Pat's, they're at home to the Champions Call City. So, you know, there's a fair, fair bit to and two over in, in, in the capital alone. Um, there's been some interesting signings in the off season. Uh, Pat's decided to find a young lad, Kevin Toner, who has a bit of uh, English Premier League experience. Aston Villa, but and Shamrock Rovers have made a very interesting signing, and I kind of went under the radar. They signed uh, Joey O'Brien, the defender who used to play for West Ham and oh, Bolton, yeah. you know, West Ham and Bolton. So I'd be curious to see how he gets on if injuries permit. You know that he he plays enough games to make an impact. Hopefully so. So look, uh, I'll go. On, I'll give you the outrights here. Uh, let me just open the page. Um, so Dundalk are at the moment so these are in decimals alright so Dundalk at the moment are 2.23 Cork 2.54 you're going with Dundalk you think that's a good pick yeah you see Cork won the double and you know they beat Dundalk in the last game of last season and they also beat them in the President's Cup the curtain raiser last weekend which wasn't televised for some reason uh, sorry I said which wasn't televised for some bizarre reason Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's a kind of debate itself. Every every season, you know, our version of the community shield it doesn't uh, it doesn't warrant televised uh, coverage. But there you go. Um, Cork when Cork, Cork in their first twenty two matches last season, they accumulated sixty four points as a possible sixty six. Mm. Uh, Sean Maguire subsequently left, and in the remaining eleven games, they 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 accumulated twelve points out of a possible thirty three. So they fell over the line when it looked like they were going to set all kinds of records. They didn't set a points record. They fell uh, one point short of equaling a record that Dundalk set in recent seasons. So I don't know if there's still a residual effect of the departure of Sean McGuire. I, I don't, I'd, I'd like to say, if Cork could get off to a bad start, it would look like a continuation of last season where they really just fell over the line. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a few little, uh, a few interesting points there. I'd like to see how they play. I think the first few weeks will will, will really give us a key indicator into how how this title race will pan out. It'd be great if that kicked off with a Pats win tomorrow night, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I'm you know I'm you introduced me as a sports journalist and I really shouldn't be biased, but <laughs> Pats, you know, I've been I've been going around to see Pats since I was four years of age, and yeah, that'd be brilliant if they started off with winning as the champions. You know, when Cork were uh, were crowned champions on Tuesday night, 
uh, back in October, they, they drew nil all with Derry City. And then three nights later, they, they came to Inchicore Cork um, and they went 2 nil up. And uh, we came back and we won 4 2. Legend. So that was actually our last home league match. And our next home league match is also against Cork. Maybe they'll be out for revenge. Maybe they're all hung over. Who knows? <laughs> but, um, from, from a Pat's point of view, that was a great win. From a Cork point of view, maybe it meant nothing at all. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a little subtext there. Of um, course. It's always a little legal as well. It's Dublin versus Cork, isn't it, you know? Yeah, well, you know, uh, some people say uh, Cork people have a chip on their shoulder. I actually think they are very finely balanced people because they have a chip on both shoulders. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, I would disagree and, with you. Uh, you were you're talking to me about the format just very quickly we'll go through and you know this is another case of the deck chairs the Titanic being rearranged the promotion situation this season is, is as daft I think as it's ever been so the team that finishes first in the first division goes up then the team that finishes third plays the team that finishes fourth <laughs> the winner of that play, faces the team that finishes second in the first division the winner of that Faces the team that finished last, second last in the Premier Division, <laughs> and then we know who goes up or, or who oh, stays up or who goes up. It's a mess, isn't it? Yeah. Every year they're just trying to reinvent it a little bit, but it just thinks of you know what haven't we done? Yeah. It's, it's never ter- it's never impressive. I don't know. Something's going to have to change. I think <laughs> maybe one league, one league to rule them on will do. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, yeah, but, but if you know if if you changed it and it was professionally run, you know. People like me would have nothing to give out <laughs> That's it, you know, the FAI, they'll always give us something to talk about and moan about anyway. Look, uh, Roland O'Flaherty, it was a pleasure to have you on and uh, hopefully during the year when there's some more talking points uh, from uh, the Premier Premier Division in Ireland, we'll have you on it. We'll have you on again. Yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you Thanks very much for having me on. I'll give you the Akka. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sevenfold Akka. So first one is uh, Leicester versus Sheffield United. So the tip is Leicester on the agent handicap minus one. The second is uh, Abar versus Barcelona, both teams to score. Then we have Schalke taking on Hoffenheim over two and a half goals. Then we have Torino Juventus, Juventus to win. Benevento Cortone from Marco. That was Benevento to win. Uh, Munchen Gladbach and Dortmund, and that is over three and a half goals. And the final one, AC Milan versus Sampdoria, over two and a half goals. And let me see, uh, the odds on that, the highest odds I can find with a bookie is 175.61. Wow. So I'm going to stick a fiver on that, and if it comes in, we'll donate it uh, to charity. All right, lads, um, before we go then, let's uh, remind everyone where you are on Twitter. Dan, where are you? You can find me on Twitter, uh, ProTip Sudan, all one word, or on Facebook, uh, ProTip Sudan, all one word. Um, come, um, give me abuse about Birmingham City, ask me for help with bets, I'll try and help you as best I can. Don't give fixed tips, don't give short bets, so don't ask, because um, <laughs> people get miffed when I go, uh, they don't exist. All right, good stuff. Uh, Johnny, where are you on the internet? <laughs> People can find me on Twitter as Prodips Johnny and Facebook as Prodips Johnny. Grand. And Martin? Yeah, on Twitter you can find me at protips.eng and on Facebook protips.martin, three separate words. Like Dan said, come and abuse me, come and ask me anything. Uh, we're here to help. If you need any questions answered about betting strategies or anything like that, we are here to give you advice. Cool. And finally then, I'm on Twitter, protipsterpod and protipsterpaddy on Facebook. And as the lads have said, you know, we're usually hanging around on the Facebook, the Pro Tips the UK Facebook page as well. So don't be shy. Come on over, say hello. And and ask us uh, any questions you want. Of course, you can listen to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, on our website, and even our blog. And we're on YouTube as well. We'll be back later on today with a Winter Olympics podcast that we've already recorded. And tomorrow, we'll have a tennis podcast. And the day after that, there'll probably be another podcast that I haven't been told about yet, but I'm going to be forced <laughs> to do as well. No, I'm only messing. We'll be back with some football on Monday. We'll be doing a live stream on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, do, um, enjoy the FA Cup or whatever you're watching this weekend and we all hope you make a couple of bob out of the matches all right good luck take it easy thanks for listening everybody don't forget to check out protipster.com where you can earn money by sharing winning football tips check us out on youtube and instagram our handles there are protipster global or get in touch on twitter 
ProTipsterEN or ProTipsterIRL. Bye.